So if you would, turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to tell a joke. Okay, cool. Is it cool if I tell a joke? All right, so there's these four guys. They're fishing. They're all out, and they're like, you know, how did we, how, they were like, how, how did you figure out how to talk your wife into being able to come fishing? And one was like, well, he said, I, I talked to her, and I said I would uh, do all the laundry and clean the house. So she said she would let me go fishing. The other guy, he said, well, how did, how did you talk your wife into it? Because you know how she is. He says, I actually told her I would remodel the bathroom for her. And he's like, wow. Okay, he got out easy. The laundry guy really got out on that one. Third guy, he's like, they were like, what, what did you do? And he says, I actually told my wife I would remodel the entire kitchen. And they were both really feeling sorry for him. And uh, so then this fourth guy, he just like, just quiet. He's not saying anything. They realized a little bit later, they're like, dude, you never said how you ended up coming. He's like, well, he said, I set the alarm for 530 that morning and I set it off and my wife woke up with me and she's and I asked her, I said, fishing or sex? <laughs> oh man. Some of y'all are still trying to get that, but you'll get it in a minute. <laughs> and some of you are so oversaved you can't believe we just said sex in church. <laughs> what? So I'm gonna just little quick lesson. Debunk God it. created it. <laughs> like he literally put two naked people together in a garden and said, Go have at it. So <laughs> I mean, I think we should be able to talk about it more than the world does, but for some reason, it's so taboo in church, but not here. And I'm sorry if there's children. You should have known we were talking. About I this. mean, let's be honest. He's, so. He called her woman for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> so, whoa, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, girl. How you doing? Hey, and, and, you know, it's really funny because I had people that made fun of me because I didn't kiss Brian before we were married. And they were like, you're going to go from, like, never kissing him to the same day kissing him to having sex. And I'm like. Have you ever asked any of your friends that go to the bar and do that, that that's weird that they meet somebody and have a one-night stand, or is it only Christian people that's awkward for? Yeah, I'm just going to say that. So, so throw that out there. We didn't you. know we were going there this morning, yeah, but well, anyway. Yeah, well, you know, just speaking truth, <laughs> just speaking truth. All right. So I think one of the, before I get into the scripture, I think that one thing that we put so much pressure on is perfection in brokenness. What I mean by that is this, is that we put so much perfection on a relationship, so much expectation for a relationship to be perfect, perfect, but we're all broken. And so we're trying to have something perfect in brokenness. And the only, the only way that our relationships are ever going to be with the, what, what they can be is by Jesus being involved in them. Because he's the only one that can make broken things beautiful. Right? And I just wanted to say that because I think it's really important to not put an expectation on your spouse in an area that, it doesn't mean that they don't work on it and they don't need to work on things. I mean, we, we are still working on things. She's a horrible communicator, so we're still, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'll have my turn later. Yeah, so yeah, don't Say worry. all you want. Say all you want. Yeah. And, and so the whole, the whole idea of us putting an expectation on somebody that is ultimately what it does is it sets us up to fail. And I remember us going into our marriage that that was one of the things that we realized early on into the relationship is that we were actually setting each up each other up to fail on a consistent basis because I had an expectation for her to meet that that it just was not she was never going to be capable of fixing it because she was broken herself and I just is just just this is just a thought it's not in the notes or anything I was just thinking about that about some of the conflicts and some of the things that we have in our marriages and relationships on a day-to-day -day basis and these could just be regular relationships like that there's, there's a brokenness in all of us. And so give each other grace to be able to get through that brokenness. Okay, so Proverbs 18, verse 2, it says this. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. Has anybody got any friends like that? Like, it's just like, that's all they do. Look, don't be looking at your spouse like that. I see you. Don't be elbowing and all that. I mean, we got to make it through this, Okay. <laughs> Uh, but it says fools have no interest in understanding. And I think that that is a critical point when it comes to any relationship is understanding, is this whole idea of interest. I think that is a, a huge word is interest, right? Because interest, what does it do? Is it, it, it puts concern in the picture, right? If I am interested in what she has to say, then I have concern to hear what she has to say. And a lot of times we have zero interest in what they have to say. We're more interested in about what we need to say to them. I have totally been there where she's screaming at me. 
I'm totally joking. But where she's saying something to me, she's talking to me about something, and I'm not even listening to what she's saying. I'm already trying to figure out how I can defend myself, how I can protect myself from what. So what happens, what I'm doing is I have no concern for what she's saying. And the whole point of this is that where there is no concern, there is no connection. And we wonder why relationships never get better is because if I don't put any concern in what she's having to say, then I can never connect to her because, because I'm not valuing what she has to say, so I'm not putting any interest in it. So I'm like, I mean, there's no connection point to have, right? It's all about, it's all about what I have to say, and it's all about how I feel, and it's all about what I need for you to hear, right? And, and, and it leaves no room for communication, <laughs> Right? I think we have a lot of times, for me, I've caught myself where it's a tendency that I would rather be the one talking. And how many you know we can get caught up in talking and it's talking, it never focuses on being heard. I mean, I mean, all talking does is it focuses on, you need to hear what I have to say. Communication isn't a one-way street. Right? Communication is your ability to hear and be able to speak. It's your ability to listen and say, okay, this is what you said. Let me dive a little deeper into it. Sometimes you never get into a deeper relationship, I mean, a, a deeper connection point in the relationship because you're still so focused on what you're going to try to say to them, right? And I think that that is why I think a lot of younger couples struggle in it is because they're taking their old, the way that they were raised, because we all have different communication points, right? We were all raised differently in how to communicate and, uh, or how to not communicate. Right, And we bring that into a marriage, and we just think that that's our normal. We just think, oh, this is how it should be. But it's not. The way that me and Alicia communicate, the way we were raised was very different. I was taught not just to, we had a big lump in the rug called sweep it under the rug syndrome. Yeah, we did that a lot in all of our, in all of our relationships. So her family, they was like, we need to talk about everything down to the, to the last detail. Shoot me in the head, because this is getting annoying. You know, and it's like, dude, we've already gone, you're circling, you're, land the plane, land the plane, right? And so we, we spend so much, they spent so much time in detail, 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 detail. And so when we get married, like, that's a big problem, right? Because I'm not. Like, yeah, because you were ready when we were arguing to just, I'm going to go to bed. And I'm like, oh, we are not letting <laughs> the sun go down on our wrath. Your wrath. He's like, I'm wow, you're, I mean, you're not even spiritual tonight. So why are you quoting a scripture? I'm like, we're staying up till this gets worked out. And I remember one Saturday, we were up till 4 a.m. Because I was like, we are not getting on that stage. Because that is one thing that we agreed upon from the very beginning. We have never once done a service youth pastors or lead pastors ever in an argument. Oh, come on. Give us a hand for that. <laughs> Cannot. Now, we I'm might kidding, have, kidding. We might have been exhausted and didn't perform as well the next morning. But we stayed up to work it out because we made we knew couples that, and I knew couples in the past when I was growing up that would go two or three, four days without talking. Like, I don't even, like, I'll pretend I'm going to have a moment where I've shut you down, and then I'll say, and let me say this. And he's like, I thought you weren't talking. I'm like, no, I am. You know, and so you just, right. you know, you think you can shut down for a second, but you just really can't. You got to talk. Right, and that, and that brings up a great point because I think what we tend to do is we tend to, as an individual, force my way of communicating on her. And she forces her way of communicating on me. And what that does is it puts an expectation that I can't meet on. on she puts an expectation or I put an expectation on her to meet that I can't. Because I process things totally different than how she does. Right? She'll say everything she wants to say. And then say sorry for whatever she says. And I'll process it. And I'm like, really? Like, and, you know, that's just the way that we're built. God made us that way. And so we've had to learn, okay, this is how we've got to navigate these waters. Right? And I think that for us, it's easy as people to put an expectation that you should communicate like me. But, but she doesn't. And your spouse doesn't communicate like you. It's, I mean, even as much as we are a lot alike with our personalities and we're extroverted and we're crazy and adventurous and all these kind of things, when it comes to communication, we're not the same. And it's easy to expect that from the other person, but you end up getting nowhere in the relationship if you do that because she doesn't really get to know who I really am because she's forcing me to communicate in a way, and then she gets the really bad side of me because she wants me to communicate like her or vice versa, right? So just that's a really interesting thing to think about. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, that as we were reading this, it says fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. I think that, that there's a huge difference in talking and communicating. 
And I think for us, that was something, because we are so extroverted and we're so willing to communicate or talk, we were a lot of times justifying communicating by talking. And I think that that's where you can really get in big trouble in a relationship is when you're just talking and not communicating. Because talking is, you've ever heard somebody talk, just they just talked their way through, right? You know, they've talked their way through something. Another day, they've, they've been really good manipulator. They've been really good at, at their, their point of view. But communication is, a, is, a, is the whole goal is to create a connection point. Like talking is not my interest if I'm talking to her. Is not my, I have zero interest in communicating and connecting, right? It's just all about what I've got to say and what she needs to hear, right? It's the same thing if she just like, I'm just going to talk, I'm going to tell you how I feel. Communi- communication, the whole idea behind it is connection. The actual word, if you break down the word communication, right, what's the first six words? I mean, first six letters. Commune. It's commune, Right? It's to have, this is the word communion. It says people living together, and everybody say this, sharing. Sharing. Huge point. Possess, it says, so it says people living together and sharing possessions and responsibilities. So, so that, in our relationship, when we're talking, guess what? There's a responsibility on both of us. But when you talk, you eliminate the other person's responsibility. When you talk when you, or when you just try to just, just have it out and it's like there's no connection point, you, you, ru- you ruin the whole point of us being able to have this responsibility of husband and wife, helpers, right? And this is where it's they only want to air their own opinions. It's only about what you want to say. It's only about how I feel, right? An opinion is an opinion. It's how you may perceive something. But what happens is when you eliminate the opinion, I'm willing to be able to hear her out. She's able to hear me out. And then I think this is the tendency in a lot of relationships is that it's like we just gotta, we've got to come to an agreement. Right? We need to, agreement is not healthy. A lot of us, we're like, oh, if I can disagree, we just need to agree. Because, no, have you ever agreed to disagree? So what happens is like, oh, we had this fight and everything's, we agreed. But then you leave with no true resolution and no true connection and then guess what happens is when there's no true resolution, guess what happens? It becomes another thing and it becomes bigger than what it was before, right? So I think it's so important to, to be able to make that an important part of a relationship. And it's in understanding. See, that's the difference between agreement and understanding. Yeah. Because it's very difficult when you, let's say you are married to an introvert who's say, not talkative. Well, they're communicating in one way. And what's happening is if you've got, and we run into this a lot in marriage counseling, if you've got somebody that's shutting down, they're communicating, I don't feel safe to share what I'm really feeling. So they are communicating. But when you do all the talking, because you're not truly communicating, what do you need from me right now that you can share your heart? What, what do you need from me? Because have I made it where you're not comfortable enough to share? Because if I'm coming into an argument and my job is to get him in agreement, that means it's to get him to believe what I believe right. or to see my point of view. So that can't. Our job in an argument is to both come out with an understanding. Because when we got married, I was under the impression that all my insecurities were going to go away because I married a hot guy. That's what I thought. I know, so spiritual, right? Sorry to bust your bubble. (laughs) Welcome, we're the lead pastors. Um, But that was my my thought process was, I'm going to marry the hottest guy I've ever seen, and that will fix it. Well, four months into our marriage, it finally, in my mind, this was reality to me. Oh, my God, he married me because I was going to help him better in ministry, and he had to give up on the looks department. We had whole 30 youth kids. Good job. Yeah, so... (laughs) But that was my thought process was it was due to, oh, I had a gift and that would be good in ministry with him. So because I knew the girls he had dated before because he forgot to throw away all the pictures in the closet in the house that I was cleaning out. And so I'm going, and you know, one's like a pageant queen and I'm like, oh my God, okay. (laughs) Like, I know you mentioned that, but I didn't know that. Okay. You know, and there's like moments and the enemy's just sitting there and just, you know, and I was like, you married me for the anointing. He's like, what are you talking about? You know, and his thing is kind of like suck it up buttercup. Like he's like. His answer to me in that moment of just utter devastation was, I chose you, didn't I? Doesn't that mean something? I'm like, okay. 
here's like a moment where you could totally like come in. And, and I kept looking for him to fix something. I kept because it is so important that when you're coming into something, I have to know what I'm bringing into a marriage. And that's a lot for you single people. You need to understand the brokenness that you are bringing into a marriage because we all have broken areas. And we bring that into the marriage. Now, a lot of times it doesn't show up and until after your marriage in, you know, we heard it this week, in a U-Haul truck. That's what happened with me. It was like, you know, a couple months went by, and I'm like, hey, I know you see that big truck that's coming. That's a lot of, like, my unhealed emotions. <laughs> and I'm, like, terrified you're going to leave me, and you don't think I'm beautiful, and all this kind of stuff. And things that had happened to me at a, at a young age, I had brought now that brokenness into our marriage because the thought, oh, he's saying, yes, I do. This is going to fix it all because I think this. And it didn't. And I think we have to be so careful that we're not taking, we don't take the time to see, okay, what's really there and what do I need to work on before I step into this marriage? And I want to read you a scripture in Proverbs 18, 13. I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible because I love it. It says, answering before listening is both stupid and rude. (laughs) Do not quote that to your spouse today when you're upset, okay? You cannot use the Bible against your spouse. I'm going to be very honest with you right now. I have so done that. I'm like, okay, Pastor Brian. (laughs) No, you guys are just a lot holier than we are. Cool. All right, so um, we'll be here next Sunday. Um, Trying to finish each other's sentences is annoying. It's not cute. I don't care what movie, you know, Frozen does it. Like, we finish each other's sandwiches. And Jay sings that all the time. I'm like, oh, that's so annoying. (laughs) And it's not a cute thing, and we think it is, because you've ever been in an argument, either with a friend or a spouse, and you think you know where they're going with it, and you start interrupting them before they've even explained to you what they're really upset about, because you know what it is, because you know them. And I think we have to be so careful, because what I had to learn was it wasn't Brian's job to make me not be insecure anymore. What is his responsibility is to understand why I'm insecure. Okay, you get what I'm saying? And he doesn't have to be insecure because he's not <laughs> to understand that. You guys, I mean, you guys know what I'm saying. Men just have this, I don't know. I mean, I have insecurities. I mean, you do, but not like, you don't have. I don't have yours. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, but we're I gonna, do have some, okay. folks, okay? I don't walk on okay, a cloud let me say and be this like, way. He, well, look at me. No, 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 no. He doesn't have it. <laughs> No, I mean, like, really, look at me. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, he doesn't, take, he doesn't have insecurities when it comes to his looks. He, that's just not something he dealt with. I remember it's one because day you I was tell like, me how good looking I am all the so time, That is so true. Baby. But he just, that's not, he'll, he'll deal with it in, like, you know. And we have a I, mirror, so every time I'm like, hey. Yes, he does. I'm just He's kidding. like, look at this. I'm 40. That's what he'll say to me. Any other husbands do that? They walk out of the shower. Come on, be like, honest. Hey, look at this. There you go. Yeah. I'm 40. It's like, yes. you really scored, baby. Like, yeah, and he just. Come on. I wish, that like, I have prayed. I'm like, God, I want to walk out of the shower naked and say that. But I don't feel that way. I'm running around the corner. Did you just say corner. naked I'm in like, church? Ah. You know, what? Did you just say naked in church? Yes, I know. <laughs> we are just breaking all the rules. It's in Genesis. Look it up. Okay. so um, Naked and not ashamed. Gosh, I know. It's ridiculous. Naked and not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's what, that was the, That's, that was the movie that was of Genesis. The, right? Naked yes. and not afraid. <laughs> Because how awesome did Eve have it because she didn't have any of that brokenness. She didn't have all that yeah. stuff that weighed her down, the things that people had said, the thoughts that had put in there. And what happens is we walk into marriage and we say, yeah. you've got to fix this. No, we walk into marriage and say, you know what, let me give you, let me kind of let you know what I, what I think I might face. Because Brian finally just said, man, I've noticed every argument we get into ends up coming back around to you don't think I really wanted to, like, choose you. Like, and he's like, I don't get it. Like, you were it for me in every area. I'd, I did not come and talk to you that day because you had sang or preached yet. I came over to the table because I saw you. And I was like, okay, that's helping. Thank you. You know, and just that continual, you know, affirmation. But what he brings is we're coming to a place of understanding because your ability to listen will determine your level of understanding. So what happened was in our marriage, Brian started to think, I really need to hear what she's saying because I've got to figure out what is happening. So I have to truly listen so I can understand where she's coming from. Jesus was amazing at this because Jesus had never been through, let's take the woman at the well. And he went up to her. He had never been in fornication or out there and doing all that. But he was able to sit and he listened and he brought understanding in her situation. 
Jesus did this everywhere he went. He was so good at listening. Even people saying things that were so untrue. And then he would come back with a statement where it's like, I understand where you're coming from, but I want you to know that I've come to bring life and bring it more abundantly. I know what you've experienced has not been that. And I think as a church, we need to do better with that because I think we just expect people, we're going to slap a scripture on you and you'll be good. Cast down every imagination. Well, that did not help me. I said that scripture 952 times, and I still felt insecure. Why? Because I hadn't actually applied casting down the imagination. We quote scripture so well, but we don't actually function and do what the scripture is saying. By faith, all these things are possible. We quote it, but have no faith. So really, it comes down to the place of what do you truly believe? And you have to know what you believe and see in yourself. That way, in turn, because you know what it is, you can come into marriage and do this so it doesn't take you years to figure it out and go, man, I really think what happened to me in seventh grade with that group of girls in my study hall telling me that I wasn't pretty and I didn't know how to wear makeup and I didn't know how to dress, I really think that affected me. And I'm almost putting you in that same study hall saying the same things even though you've never said it. I'm doing the same thing because... There's a core belief in me that believes this, and I need your help to not believe it. I wanted him, and originally I thought, well, if you'll say these certain phrases, if you'll say these certain things, you know, you're the most beautiful woman I could have ever married. If you'll just send that text to me like every other day, I think it'll fix it. No, that's like putting a Band-Aid over something that needs to have surgery. I needed to go to God, find my security in him where he said, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. We can quote it, but who really believes it? It's because we have to take a hold of truth and allow that to lead us. Yeah, and going back to your point with the whole listening thing is I think that something that I I believe is really critical is, you know, the Bible gives us this depiction of being helpmates, right? We're here to help each other. And the one thing I've learned through marriage is when I do actually listen, which is really difficult for me sometimes, I'm just like, you know, I've gotten better, but it's still a struggle for me, um, is that when I listen, it gives me an opportunity to speak to a wound that I wouldn't have been able to. Because when I'm listening, I get to see and I get to have an understanding of a deeper part of what she's actually really trying to communicate. Because under her communicating one thing, there's actually something else that's being said. And when I listen, I'm able to speak to that wound and I'm able to help be that support system to help her walk through that wound or that pain. I mean, because at the end of the day, we all, like we've said, we've all got some sort of a wound that we've grown up with, and, and it comes out. There's nothing that highlights it like marriage, like we talked about last week. There's nothing that highlights brokenness like marriage, because that's where you have to be the most vulnerable. That's where you have to be the most, you know, open to somebody is in a marriage. And so when I'm really willing to listen to her, I'm able to connect and speak into something that no one else should ever be able to do. It should be my responsibility to speak into a pain or a hurt, an insecurity, uh, an issue that's going on in her, but I miss that opportunity. I, I'm actually robbing myself of brownie points, if you know what I'm talking about, men, by being able to speak into that, right? And so I think it's super critical for us to, to be able to listen and with the intent of, like, really, I'm just listening. Like, I just want to hear, hear you out. And then in that, it's like God allows the Holy Spirit to flow through us and to be able to speak into something, I mean, I've, several times we've, that's happened with both of us. I mean, she, she'll be able to see something that I didn't see because she was willing to listen and there was something deeper that was going on. And I think that that's, that's a healthy marriage. Like, that's what marriage should look like. That's what a relationship should look like is it's like I'm willing to help you in whatever brokenness you're at. And so I think, I think that that's so critical for, for the success of a marriage. Um, my, I want to go to Colossians chapter 4, and in verse 6 it says this. And this is, again, this is so applicable for every relationship. And it says this. It says, let your conversations be gracious and attractive. Right? And then it goes on and it says, so that you will have the right response for everyone. And, you know, I think that, that we can all respond. We've all been there as as friends or married couples and we've said something that it's like oh can I have that back right and that is the byproduct of that why did we do that is because we weren't listening and we were just wanting to talk we were just wanting to say something had nothing to do with the benefit of that person we were just like I'm just gonna let you know how I feel and I've done that and 
and it's destroyed relationships. It's, it's destroys and never builds up. And so I, I love the whole concept of that. My ability to have, to have a, a, for things to be gracious and attractive are based on my ability to have a right response. And so what, how, how do I have that right response? It goes back to the whole, the whole concept of, of this woman at the well. And Jesus, how was he able to how was he able to respond to this woman who was a prostitute who he had every right to just tear down? He empathized with her. He connected with her on a personal level where she was hurting. And that, that leads me to the, 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 another point that I want to hit on is that empathy allows the heart to be heard. He allowed her heart to be heard. And that's what relationships, that's where if you ever see a healthy relationship, it's where empathy is, 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 is really alive and and being valued, that I'm willing to connect to somebody on a personal level, because that, at the end of the day, empathy is me feeling your pain. I like to look at it as, it's like right now, if, 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 you know, if there was this opportunity to have backstage passes with us right now, or to go to wherever, and you get a backstage pass, it would be me, I would be able to give you a backstage pass if you empathize with me. Because what it's saying is I trust you to come to this place with me to be able to be in this position where I know you could hurt me. So I give you this VIP card because I, you're willing to empathize with me. So my point is, is this, is that a relationship goes way farther and way deeper and way healthier if you can empathize with somebody, if you can connect to them where they're at emotionally, right? Because so many times, all of relationships are built on emotions. I know that I, for a long time, uh, um, um, empathy was a, this is a new word for me. If, if you're, if I'm really honest, this is a new, this is a new word for me. I, I, I just learned empathy like a few years ago and I'm like the actual concept of it. Yes, I've heard it, but for me to actually connect to somebody on a personal painful level, if they're hurting, that's new because when I was, when I was growing up, I came from a construction background and my dad, I mean, it was like, suck it up buttercup like you need to be tough you need to do whatever I mean I remember me and my dad I was working with my dad and we were framing a house and my dad was cutting the roof in rafters and I was putting them up and all of a sudden my dad was like hey uh come come down we need to go to the the hospital I gotta sew my finger on it just cut it off and I remember thinking like that's that's the only response and I think this is what we do a lot of times is that's what we try to do is we're like oh it's not a big deal we try to make things that are a really big deal not very big, but when you empathize with somebody, you're actually coming down to their level, and you're saying, man, like, that's, it's cut off. Like, your finger is missing. We've got to do something about that. Oh, it's no big deal. But what happens is that now you're able to help them see even something that they may not even see. And that's the power of empathy. But I wasn't raised that way. I was like, dude, just put a Band-Aid. If you, if in construction, if you didn't have super glue duct tape, I mean, that's all you needed, a little black table, super, super glue, and you were good to go. And I think that it's so important, no matter where you're at in your marriage or your life even right now, because let's say you're single, and there's conversations you need to have with family members to heal some wounds. Don't bring those into your marriage, or you've been married for a long time, and there are wounds that you've let go unhealed. It's never too late to start looking at what can I do now? And when you go in with empathy, and listen, we, we don't have this figured out. We both talk to counselors. And you know why? It's made us healthier than we've ever been. Not because there's a problem. And, and you know, we're so smart when it comes to natural things. Most of us, you know, eat before we die of hunger. Uh, most of us fill our car up with gas before we run out of gas. But for some reason, we wait to ask God to help us in our marriage when it's completely broken and fallen apart. We, we ask God for help when there's nothing left, nothing left. And, and that's the kind of stuff we've got to stop doing because we need to start being proactive and not reactive. Because that's the problem with where we're at in this day and age is we've got to become emotionally healthy. And I don't think it's something that's talked a lot about in the church, but honestly, I wish now as a youth pastor I would have had a lot of this because I was trying to give people, here is the narrow road, this is how you live. And so many of them were failing in some areas because emotionally they were damaged. And if we could have stepped away for a moment and helped that, the narrow road would have been a lot easier journey for them. But for them, it was so much, oh, I've got to check off this check mark and I've got to do this and, and I've got to pray this long and, and do this and do this. And I don't have a checklist for my relationship with my husband. My job is I just want to know him. 
and I want to know how I can be a better wife, and I want to know what I can do to make him be the man that God's called him to be, because it's not always about who you married, it's why. Because I think when you can look at the why, and I look at the why, and I know I would not be the worship leader I am today if it wasn't for this man. I wouldn't be near as good of a wife because he's helped me walk through so many pain and insecurity, and he has seen the worst. And we have, we have faced devastating situations together, but that's the key, together. He had to preach the night I was miscarrying at home. He was at youth having to preach. And we weren't sure if that was what was happening. And he came home, and I'll never forget, he just sat in the bed with me, and he just cried with me. He didn't try to quote a scripture to me. And no, he didn't know what I was feeling in my body, and he didn't know how it was affecting me. But what he knew was I can come right now with empathy, and I can hold you, and we can go through this together. And the years of me believing God to get pregnant, he was just consistent. And the months were as hard because he said, I don't have to go through what you go through because every month you're disappointed. He said, I'm disappointed too, but you know it because of your body. It, it lets you know, hey, you're not. And he said, you're having to face that every single month. But what he did was he came from a place of understanding. So what I encourage you to do, find some common ground. Heal some of those emotions and those places of brokenness. Sit and have a conversation. We've had six, seven-hour conversations. We go on marriage retreats where we go and for two days we just talk. What can we do better this year? How can I help? What can I do to be a better wife? And some of it's practical. Some of it's like, I just like a few, you know, more home-cooked meals. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. You know, it's just, I, I, I know, out. I got it, I got it. You know, I'm like, I'm not Joan Jetson, okay? You know, and it's like, I, you know, going through these, but it was like, what, what, okay, yes, that brings stability for you, so I want to work on that. Those are the things that we're, we're talking about. There are some practical, but there are some spiritual healing that I believe that God wants to do because I'm going to blow your mind with something. When you look in the Bible, God always talks about his relationship to the church as a relationship that it looks like in marriage. Marriage was actually created to make people fall in love with Jesus. Did you know that? They were supposed to actually see a married couple and their selflessness together and go, man, I want to fall in love with Jesus because the love between you two is incredible. It's supposed to model that. That's why Jesus created marriage. It was supposed to actually make people want not to get married, to actually fall in love with Jesus. But how many of our marriages, if we're honest, actually make people want to follow Jesus? When the divorce rate is just as high in the Christian world, that shows me the enemy has come in and perverted. Everything that's coming into the world right now is completely to come against and destroy. If it's taking babies before they're born, then it's to kill a destiny. If it's to, to, to live an alternative lifestyle, it's taking from what God created. I'm telling you, there are so many different things the enemy is looking to take away what marriage was meant to be, and it was to show the love of Jesus. And that is something we put on the forefront of our heart for 2019. I want people to fall in love with Jesus because they see the selflessness between us. And listen, folks, I have a long way to go. And I mean that honestly. There are things in me that I know that God is saying, you got to get rid of this. You've got to get rid of this. You've got to let this go. But it's one step at a time. And, you know, going back to the whole idea of empathy, is I, I love the whole process of what empathy does because what it does is it, it gives you this privilege. I think if you look at empathy, it's, it is a privilege that what God allows you to do because he opens the veil, right? Like, you know, in, in the New Testament, there was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies to the, to, to the inner. And, and that's what empathy does is it gives you this privilege to go into a place to see the most vulnerable part of that person. And without empathy, like, I think a lot of us, you're like, man, I want to connect to you. I want to connect on a deeper level. But are you trying to connect with them? It's easy to want to connect and want the benefits of it. But are you willing to, to have empathy and to go to that place where it may be uncomfortable for you as a man to feel the emotions that you have to feel to get there? Right? And, and so I think that that's so important is that it, it creates a perspective. It, it allows you to see a perspective that you would have never seen before if you didn't have the empathy right? It allowed, Jesus was able to see a new level of this woman at the well on a whole nother level because he got a new perspective because of how he connected to her. If he just said, hey lady, how you doing? Give me some water. And it was just like, whatever. But he saw, 
oh, this, this woman's hurting. Like she, we think she just wanted water, but she wanted something deeper than water. And there's things that are your spouse is crying out for. They're not saying it on the outer level, but empathy allows you to see things that you would have never had the privilege to see if you weren't willing to connect to them, right? And so the, I, this is where I want to kind of close is this, is that, the, you know, empathy is, is this ability to allow you to have intimacy on a whole nother level. Not sex. I'm not talking about that. However, it does produce that. That empathy actually determines your level of intimacy. Is that what I mean by that is, look, the more that I'm empathetic with her or she's empathetic with me, the more that I'm willing to scoot my chair and, and be close to her and be intimate and say, okay, actually, you were willing to will it. You were really willing to hear my pain or my frustration. I'm going to move my chair a little closer. And it creates intimacy. And a lot of marriages are missing. Yeah, you guys hang out together. You cohabitate together. You, you know, you live together. You make money and you do things together and you eat together. But are you having intimacy? I can't tell you how many times me and Alicia talk about it. We try to do this. On a, on a really intentional level, but I can't tell you how many times we'll go to a nice restaurant, and this is the this is the date that everybody else has, and there's no connection. It's like we wonder why are, why am I missing? What am I missing in my marriage? It's like well, you're opening up to a coworker more than you are your own spouse, right? And we're wondering why are we missing this deep connection? It's because we're not putting the same energy into this. That we are our coworkers or our friend. And I think it's so important that if you want to increase the level of intimacy sexually and, and relationally, you need to start empathizing with them. You've got to start having that deeper connection.